And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, welcome, welcome all of you another week. Uh, it is Monday. It's not Wednesday, nor is it Friday. And I had to remind myself of that today uh, because this is our new day. Fridays move to Mondays on the PWBA podcast. My name is Emil Williams Jr. Welcome to Bowl TV. And of course, joined as always by my guy, my main man, Aaron A. A. Ron Smith. Aaron, how was your weekend? Uh, pretty good weekend, Emil. Obviously, uh, still uh, still taking it easy on the far as far as going out and all that fun stuff. But uh, you know, the cool thing about moving to Mondays is we're so much closer to uh, the most previous episode of The Last Dance. So I uh, definitely enjoyed that last <laughs> night. That's kind of my my big week thing that I'm looking forward to now. So uh, you know, fresh off that, we got some, got some Dream Team stuff. Uh, throughout those past episodes, which was definitely very interesting, very cool. So I uh, definitely enjoyed that. And I think a member of anyone's dream team in bowling uh, is our guest today. So really looking forward to uh, to our conversation coming up. Without question. And uh, we might as well say without further ado, I'll ask you, uh, I know we had a clip to play. Are we going to save that for uh, later in the conversation? Uh, let's start it up right now. Let's get, uh, okay. let's get a quick look here. This is going to be our guest today, USBC Hall of Famer Kelly Kulik six-time major champion. This is a uh, quick look from her performance earlier this year at the Team USA Trials, which she won with a record 13 points. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up here throughout the podcast. But Dominating performance. A few shots here from the Gold Coast in Las Vegas. It's, it's good to see bowling again. We like bowling, yes. <laughs> it's great to see bowling. How about that? All 10 back, taking care of business. And the wave to Jason Thomas to wrap things up. And one of my favorite jerseys, of course, as well. Uh, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kelly Kulik to the PWBA podcast. Kelly, how are you today? Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we appreciate you uh, sharing some time. Again, folks, uh, we'll be sure to drop a few questions. If you have some for, for Kelly throughout the chat, we will get to those at a couple of points during the broadcast. Uh, but Kelly, we, we kind of start every podcast with, uh, you know, we would like to know, A, how are you doing? And uh, really, B, what how are you staying busy amidst uh, the quarantine situation, of course, and uh, what's the latest news in New Jersey? Well, thank you for asking, gentlemen. I'm going to add remodeling to my resume. Okay. I've been home. I was able to repaint my office, which was Pepto Bismol pink, and it's <laughs> oh. now Cayman Island blue. So it's it's inspiring me for retirement. Beautiful colors. I also repainted my kitchen accent wall to make it pop a little bit more with the white trim and border. Uh, I recalked my bathtub yesterday. Working upstairs currently on the upstairs shower. Uh, so my resume is just growing in terms of handy woman, what I'm able to do, and Google's been my best friend. New Jersey itself, I've been good. My friends, family, uh, and close relatives have been healthy, fortunate enough that we've been safe and, and it hasn't touched us at all. Um, some prayers have gone out to some friends, of course, that have struggled with it. But New Jersey, obviously, we're second to New York with the most cases and, and unfortunate deaths. We're just our governor's been very proactive, Mr. Murphy himself, no relation to Chad, but um, really just being proactive, open up the state parks this weekend. We had beautiful weather. Everybody got out. I'm still wearing the mask when in public and just playing it safe and making each day go by as best I can. That was beautiful weather here uh, in the Chicagoland area this weekend as well. How was the weather in uh, DFW, Aaron? Uh, it's starting to warm up a little bit, so we're getting uh, a little bit closer into the 90s now. So, but uh, had some bright and sunny skies all weekend, so that was fun. Didn't get, like we said, didn't get out too much. But uh, Kelly, I have to ask, what is the uh, what is your recommendation for brands of paint? Ooh. Brands of paint. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm a Consumer Report subscriber, and I, I read all their recommendations. And what I have used for every room in my house has been. Um, Clark Kensington. So it's sold at Ace Hardwares. I believe they also own Valspar, but uh, Clark Kensington, it's got the primer built into it, all the different shades from eggshell to matte and um, gloss. Good paint, highly recommend it. I should get $5 for that nod there. <laughs> as I say, that was, that's pretty impressive. I'll have to take and keep that in mind when it's, uh, when it's time as well here. Uh, Kelly, so I know you've been um, 
uh, taking a few appearances uh, on the on the Storm Show of the Morning Boat uh, with you know, Leanne, Blair, and Gary. Uh, and also been teaching some moves to the fans uh, in regards to line dancing. So first couple questions are, uh, are you only into line dancing? And then are there other types of dances that you also enjoy that maybe we don't know about? Uh, I, I do like all types of dancing. Freestyle, I, I do much better with patterns, and hence why I really focus on line dancing, just repetitive motions over and over again. I would love to learn ballroom dancing and the foxtrot and other dances like that. But the line dancing, it's single. I can go out with friends. I have a gentleman friend that I can two-step with and get around the room. It, it's a great social activity, and dancing has proven to keep the brain active at all times. And it's proven that it, it kind of defends dementia and Alzheimer's in the long run. So Blair, Leanne, and Gary have been great um, students of mine. I think I gave Gary the hard one. But it was <laughs> just a way to connect with the Storm Nation and, and the Bowling Fan Nation out there at Bowl TV, of course, as well. And show them, hey, there's this other side of me that they've seen on the telecast. But now they can join me in my living room by, by teaching them how to move. That's what's up. Um... What what's it like dancing in front of crowds before like a, a, a live TV show, for example, uh, on tour or CBS Sports Network? You you have been prominent in many cases, kind of getting the crowd involved uh, before we go live. What's that like, and and, and why do you do that? Uh, there have been a few shows where the spectators and fans have just been kind of sitting there, twiddling their thumbs, just really trying to get them engaged. And obviously they know my, my specialty on the lanes as a bowler. The approach is a great place to dance. You can move around and slide with your footing. <laughs> and, and those dance moves even looks even more spectacular. But it's really just to build up the energy in the room itself, get them ready for the upcoming show, and to really put in the forefront the women bowlers coming on and keeping that energy all the way through the telecast. Now we've seen some instances of uh, even in the booth, you and Dave Ryan, uh, cutting it up just a little bit to uh, to kind of <laughs> add some fun to the crowd. How would you rate Dave as a dancer? Uh, Dave gets a 10. Because <laughs> he, um, he's ambitious, he's not shy, and he gives it a try. So now I got him moving his shoulders in the booth. I got him to go into the side and side back with me. I think he feels the energy too. And then it, it relates into what we're seeing on the lanes. And again, it energizes myself and him, uh, the ladies in front of the screen. But really, it gives us a connection personally, and um, I know he enjoys it, but I give him a 10 because he gets up there and he dances, he's not shy, and anything he'll do anything to, to get the crowd to smile. Now, Aaron, before we shift gears, I got to ask Kelly. Kelly, have you ever, ever heard of uh, the Chicago stepping set? Like, it, it's a dance. Have you heard of that? I'm not familiar with it. Okay, it's okay, because I, I think you'd be great at it. And yeah. uh, I'm going to see some videos after this, and um, I'm going to ask you to, to put this in, on your resume tape. I look forward I, to it. You know, guys, I love challenges. I love movement, so bring it on. I, there's some great social dances out there. Everybody on Facebook right now and Zoom, we're all getting together. It's uh, it's bringing the nice. music together. Fantastic. This this sounds fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Send this to me, too. To okay. okay. Make it out of my shell a little bit. Uh, I got you. One of the things we've been doing on social media to uh, kind of give the fans something to interact with is the Ultimate Queens Bracket Challenge. And Kelly is a two-time winner of the Queens. Uh, you are part of the bracket. You're in the top eight right now and have a matchup coming up later this week with uh, Shannon Pluhowski to get into the Final Four. Uh, but looking at the Queens, obviously a very unique event, a fun event. You've had a lot of success there. Uh, what is it about that event that uh, you just find so fun and has kind of led to you to having so much success? Well, the Queens, everybody gets the bullet. Every USBC member, female member gets the bullet. And um, fair qualifying through, get, through blocks of five. But really what gets exciting is, is when you get into the matches. Total pinfall for three games. And so many times I've seen a, a competitor down by 50 or 60 pins, and then she starts off the next match with seven or eight in a row. And the person she's competing against is like, what do I do? What do I do? The only, the only offense is to be – aggressive there is no defense when it comes to that and it really gives something for the crowd to view in and to watch it puts you in more pressure situations because every frame is just as valuable as the next it always comes down to the 10th frame but you're building up from frame one to the end from games one through three so really i like the pressure situations i like the excitement it brings to the fans and the spectators 
and the adrenaline you get to feel through your through your nervous system is fantastic. It's unlike anything else. Is there potentially a favorite match in your Queen's career that you can uh, that you can single out as a favorite? Obviously, winning it twice has got to be pretty cool, but um, maybe in one of those three game matches where there was just you know a high scoring event or just a close finish, uh, you know, throwing the big shots to move on to the next round or stay alive in the bracket. Uh, any particular match really uh, really stick out to you? Um, I needed a footnote in the notes you sent me to be prepared. For <laughs> Not really. I, I do recall I, I lost the Queens um, in Reno when we were crossing the convention center, but I did have the front nine against Lisa Bishop and that the 10th one and it was a little slow and I big four, but it was really a, an awesome experience to win that match and to go on to the final match and unfortunately lose. But it's still to this day, it was just a, a great experience. I, might, I still have a couple goals in mind, and one of them is, and I know you asked me later too, is to shoot 300 on TV. To watch Daria do it, to see Liz and Kara and Michelle Feldman in the past do it, it's, it's what, definitely one of the goals in my future I'd like to achieve. Speaking of uh, on the lanes performances, uh, the last time we saw you and uh, we showed a, the, the, the clip to begin the show was at Team USA Trials, and you're coming off a performance uh, for the second straight year. Uh, you, you do your thing. What were some of the highlights of, of that moment of that week um, and the biggest takeaways perhaps from that performance uh, early in 2020? Uh, gentlemen, I really went in with no expectations. Uh, I love Team USA and I want to be a part of it as long as I can to where I can feel I can contribute both as an athlete, as a coach. But I really went in with no expectations. I hadn't practiced much. I kind of overdrained my mental game of trying to be the best or be the student in the game and the coach and the bowler tied into one it doesn't always work and I overanalyze it's just definitely one of my fallbacks and, and flaws in my game but I went with no expectations I saw the patterns the center definitely caters to me because it's high friction I've got a lot of high access rotation the ball gets down a little bit easier down the lane for me we bowled there so many times but I do know the characteristics of it so I know the high end is tighter the low end hooks in the middle is where the scores do tend to come from and I went in there with confidence of like, hey, I'm 42 years old. I'm a veteran of this sport. I've done and been in this situation so many times just to let my body go through its grooves. And, and that's exactly what happened. And, you know, I, I kind of mad at myself because the last day I could have won the last day, too, and really cut those points in half, too. I didn't take the risk the last game and I kicked myself for it. But it was still by far a stellar performance. I hope somebody breaks it because that would be another great performance in the future and to see where our talent really is. But it was an unbelievable week with a, a fascinating ending. And I don't know if I'll get to bowl the World Cup because of what the current situation, but it, it's still to go back-to-back -back champions and in the fashion that I did will, will definitely be a highlight uh, in my resume again. Now, now, I know the World Cup was something on, on your list uh, prior to heading out there last year. Um, obviously, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, we don't know the how it's going to play out with that, but... Uh, what would it mean to have a, have a second chance to uh, take home that title? Everything. Everything. There's really there's not much in Team USA competition that I haven't had the privilege of winning. Um, all events medal at, at Worlds, World Championships and, and uh, Masters, I have yet to win that. I won it in the youth. But that's another goal there. And you, the talent's different, but you really get to kin rekindle with a lot of the other countries. And, you know, I met a woman from Egypt who watched me and learned how to bowl watching videos of me on YouTube. I thought that was pretty fascinating, you know? Awesome. Uh, so I'd like to go back. Shannon won it for Team USA. You know, Kyle lost uh, to Australia. Australia, Beck Whiting won it this year. I, I really would just like to go back and, and have that um, accolade also um, on my resume too. It's just, it's the World Cup. There's there's no other bigger word than the word world. We certainly will be rooting for you for, uh, for that to happen. Uh, as we're talking about Team USA, though, and kind of at the beginning of the show, this is going to be another question off the off the we didn't have on the list. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we talked about kind of the dream team as far as uh, NBA basketball, and obviously, I, I think pretty much everybody on the earth would include you in their dream team for uh, for bowling for Team USA. But uh, you know, and kind of thinking about that, if you had to put together, you know, from all the Team USA teammates you've had over the years, if you had to put together uh, your your top five to uh, go out and win a gold medal at the world championships. Uh, who would those players be? Oh, top five dream team. So you have myself, Liz Johnson, of course. I would pick CDB, Karen Dolan Ballard. Um, 
really shot maker to this day for sure is Danielle McEwen. She would be my fourth. And uh, right now, just because she has a, a determination and success of something I haven't seen in a while, and comparable to Liz would be Shannon O'Keefe. That would be my five on Team USA to go out right now to against any team in the world and, and feel like we can come home with every single title. That is a solid squad there. Bonus hypothetical. You're also coaching. Who's who's throwing the 10th frame? If I'm coaching who's throwing the 10th frame, Liz, <laughs> no doubt. She is the best closer, female or male, I've ever seen in on both tours. The next second closest to her, and I mean talking a fraction close, that I've seen in my career is Patrick Allen. I've seen him close out, strike out many more matches than lose, and, and he, those are by far my top two. Shout out to PA, be a USPC Hall of Famer. Yeah. Uh, as well. So, uh, keeping on the Team USA theme, uh, 16 years uh, total on your career when you think about it, including the last 11 uh, on, on the squad. What are some of your favorite Team USA moments? Uh, I'd have to imagine some of the players that you just talked about would be included potentially in some of those moments as well. Uh, but some of your favorite moments that you look back at your time? Uh, our two team titles in Hong Kong, because Carolyn was on that team, and then we just kind of ran the board with those 17 strikes in a row. Definitely a highlight. The next time we won in Abu Dhabi, because Korea was the favorite, and we beat them on short, which everybody knows we, we seem to struggle on short, and we were prepared for it. I, I give Coach Rod so much credit really training us to be prepared for that. There, my first ever world championship, I won the gold medal in singles. And it really put things in perspective in Abu Dhabi of how the event carried on. And I didn't care, I didn't medal in all events, I was fourth, but it just gave us a whole a deeper understanding of what team bowling is at a global level. Those three by far are, my, are one of the tops. And then when the world singles event came out and I won it the first time out alongside Chris Barnes from Team USA, and then I was able to defend that title again. It really is some special moments. But by far, the, the two team gold medal victories ranked the highest in my Team USA uh, career. Excellent, nice. excellent. Um, looking back at, uh, you know, obviously our situation is a little unclear right now as far as what the PWBA Tour may look like here for 2020. But, uh, you know, for you, uh, obviously, we were we we're all preparing to get ready for it starting, uh, you know, last month, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, after kind of a rough 2019, what were kind of your expectations and goals for the 2020 season? Uh, well, gentlemen, honestly, I was kind of taking a backseat to the tour this year. I was going to come out and bowl all the majors and a handful of other events as well. I really struggled last year to enjoy being out on the ladies tour. My mindset was not good last year. Um, there were times where I didn't want to be there. There were times where I thought the format was really mentally draining me and overshadowed some of my decisions. Uh, I just didn't have fun last year. So I, my plan for 2020 was to just to kind of set back a little bit more, bowl some of the majors and see if it would change my perspective on bowling overall, if I could find some more of the love again or the passion for it to do it full time again. So that's really what 2020 was gonna be like. It was gonna be a, a modification of a full tour swing for me. Would you say almost kind of a chance to kind of reset the batteries, not have the the week to week toils that we kind of see on tour? Yeah, I, I didn't mind the week to week grind. Um, I, it just I don't know if it's physically I'm still in some of the best shape I've ever been, but at 42, the the long Fridays and you gentlemen experience themselves back on the media side of it, you had to endure what we did, just in a different position, and it made for really long days. It made for really long nights and short sleep nights and not eating the right way I wanted to eat and, and just questioning a lot of things. Um, and then I, I didn't make the, the exempt field and then I had to requalify and then that was fine there. But it, it really, I didn't have fun. I didn't have fun. I, I'd like to see, and I, I will say this honestly, like our US Open, I wish it was in another venue. Um, I'd like to see quality. I'd like to see um, all the competitors on a fair level um, and I'd like to see our prize funds get larger, just like everywhere. Everybody wants that too. And it's, it's not a complaint. It's just an observation. So I'm so grateful the tour is back. I am thrilled PWA has brought exposure and given opportunities to the younger generation. I mean, watching these Team USA bowlers just go and, and where they're going to be in 10 years on the tour is fantastic. It's great opportunities. I just didn't have as much fun. So like you said, Aaron, I was going to charge the batteries, take some time up and then see where it brought me or... I, it's going to lead me in another direction. 
maybe not come back at all. I'm not really sure, but I had to find out one way or another by, by stepping back to see what, what direction it's going to push me in. Sounds like some direct uh, parallels, I'd imagine, to the first portion, let's say, you know, 2015, 16, 17, and 18. Perhaps what was the differences in, in those seasons and obviously still early in the relaunch period? Uh, differences there as opposed to what you experienced last year? Uh, it, the, the relaunch was exciting, you know, just to be able to travel to meet the, the proprietors at the centers and have, welcome us with open arms. Um, the energy level, it was great to see our membership grow the first three to four years. Um, I just, I just found last year it became more challenging getting to some of the venues, the expenses increased, how many bowling balls you could ship on the truck. Um, Shannon had such a dominating career and everything. It was great to see her have success. I guess I just wanted to see maybe some more expansion, uh, some more events along the way, but bringing the excitement back to it, the first two seasons, 015 for sure. And then like anything you just have to challenge yourself other ways i still haven't been player of the year and that is by far one of my ultimate goals in my career so uh, my career is not over i just like i said aside a little little detour to mm -hmm. come back uh but it's definitely from the beginning of the year was the excitement by the end of the year it's just like ah, i have to reconsider some things if i want to still be um prosperous nothing wrong with a little recalibration you know, it, it happens and sometimes very necessary um, in those instances. Um, so shifting gears ever so slightly. Um, and then this is one of Aaron's favorites. So back in, you know, 2012, we, we always go back to the U.S. Women's Open um, in a very unique uh, opportunity uh, setting, the conditions, etc. cetera. Um, very fortunate to cover a lot of your great wins in that. The experience of what you went through uh, kind of from start to finish uh, during that event, building a huge lead, the, condition, the excuse me, conditions we talked about, and then against Missy in the finals. Take us back to that experience, and if you can describe to the viewers and the listeners uh, what it was like to be where you were on the streets on Virginia Street in Reno. Lights, sounds, the smells of the sausage sandwiches behind me <laughs> roasting on the grill, people clicking their glasses in joy. The little wind tunnel coming over the dust onto the lanes itself, ambulance sirens in the background, and by far the best thing was when the mayor had all the people in the garage building, they exited them out and the mayor went up there and he said, nope, let those people stand there. That's just the, the background, that's just the setting itself. Um, you, you dig deep as an athlete, and I remember the interviews prior to that, the, the year before I finished second again, and I just, I didn't want to let that happen. So really for me, hair in a ponytail, slick it back. I wasn't going for a beauty contest. I never am, let's face it. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not gonna be on Vogue anytime soon and I'm okay with that. So athletic as I could be, as prepared and be able to adapt to anything that came in front of me. That's what I did, I was a chameleon. I just kept changing color, adapting any any scenario that popped up just for the fact that they wanted to reoil the lanes between matches, it wouldn't be fair. And um, I think just because of my age allowed me to understand some of the tools I learned when I was 10 and 12 and 14 years old that maybe some of the younger women didn't know, straighten it out, go hard at the head pin, change the angle, you know, really just do everything possible to, to try to achieve a winning score. And that's what I did, but fantastic to be outside surrounded by the, the sounds, the bleachers to the left of you and the people behind you, wind blowing through your hair, the lights change in red and green. And again, like I said, sausage sandwiches right behind me. I, I, I can never talk, talk about food. It was great. It was great. Now, I went back and kind of looked at some of the footage from that show. And obviously, uh, as you mentioned, the lights, just the, just the arena of being outside the, the Great Arch in Reno. But, uh, you know, looking at some of the some of the weather stats of all things, uh, they said it was about 15 miles per hour. By the time it got to the championship match, the temperature had dropped about 10 degrees, 15 degrees or so. Uh, I mean, just it, was there any way to prepare for any of that? There was none. There was none because our practice session was about 1230 in the afternoon when the sun was at its highest and the lanes were about 98 degrees beating on it. So the oil just started to disperse even more. I went and I practiced in the stadium. I had bowled nationals already, so I, I, I needed to feel comfortable. Um, but, you know, we're used to bowling at nighttime, but not nighttime outside. So again, it's just every variable that was presented to me was just how do I adapt? How do I adjust? What do I do? What do I need? Where do I need to stand? Where do I need to look? Um, how do I need to stay warm? How do I need to stay cool? 
shine the ball up as much as I possibly can besides spitting on it and, and just trying to polish it that way. Um, yeah, it was just, it was great. You can't prepare. You can't, bowling is one sport where you can try to predict what's going to happen, but it still not may not happen that way. You, can, you can't really outguess. You can only prepare. And I was just the best prepared for that event as I possibly could have been. Now we have a, uh, we actually have a clip queued up for, uh, for this. So we're going to take you back to the 10th frame of the title match against Missy. Uh, you've already made the uh, first shot in the 10th. Hold on one second here while I get it popped up here. All right, there we go. And we're going to let you, uh, you have to pick up the spare to lock her out. So if you could uh, kind of run us through this. And just on these conditions, what you were thinking. I mean, this has been the ultimate test. She had to go through multiple qualifying blocks through two rounds of match play. The stadium is a very difficult place to bowl. There are many I'm challenges just looking as you move across that building. She handled all of those. And then little did she know that was the least of the challenges this week. She comes over here, basically goes through a, a completely different environment. Bowling on what's turned into basically bowling in a parking lot in a, almost a strip lane. She's adapted to that, done what she's needed to do to give herself a chance for this moment. Chris Barnes and Dave Lamont on the call. She makes it. She yeah, here, here you think I'm wiping off the oil? I'm not. I'm wiping off the dust. <laughs> <laughs> Every spare was so crucial. You know, all this emotion right here was really pent up from losing the year before. I mean, I finished second three twice in three years. I won it in 10. I won it in 12. I finished second, I think, the next two years after that. This has been such a great event for me, except the last three years. It really hasn't been a good event the last two years for me. I've been very disappointed in my performance last year in Vegas and then the year prior. But really, again, just trying to throw it straight and hard. I don't throw it hard to begin with. Keep it on the lane and find the head pin. It did not matter. I mean, Misty, I give her so much credit. Her hair is down. She pulled great. And she walked away with $25,000. Jason Couch, obviously I was with Evan for so long. I think I broke Mike Calderon's back when I fell down off that. <laughs> Mike Calderon signing. Nicely yeah. done. Yeah, <laughs> but I was so grateful for the staff. And the ladies and the commentator. I think Chris is a great commentator. Oh, so 40,000. He's just really great. And it's just, I mean, Linda Barnes, if you guys don't know at that, at that show, that morning she went to get a quarter zone shot in the shoulder. She had, had shoulder surgery. She was fighting, a, well, she was going to have shoulder surgery. She was fighting a, um, an injury. And she made the show. And that morning they found a doctor that would give her a quarter zone shot just so she could to bowl on that show. So. There's a another Team U.S. player. Shannon did it with a kidney stone. Linda's bowling for the U.S. Open title with a quarter zone shot in her shoulder. People really dig deep in, in when, they're, when their back is pressed against the wall, when, when money's on the line, when a title's at the line and everything. Now, I have to ask, did you keep the spare ball? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's in my office. So right now I'm in my living room space. Mm -hmm. You see my, my wine glass is behind me and my stairway up there. But it's in my office. And Kegel was really cool. The, the lanes, unfortunately, were brand new, but then they were ruined after that. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a little vial of all the dirt that they accumulated. Oh, the nice. The that they took off the lane. So I've got that, <laughs> the ball, and the trophy all right next to each other up in my trophy case. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. Great. Wow. Thanks for sharing that with us, Kelly. That yeah, was, that, was, that was... That was fun to kind of go back to that. That was... Uh, I had the opportunity to cover that event, and I think I interviewed you throughout the week as you took the lead in the second round and kind of the rest of the way out. So I also appreciated you finding new ways to answer all my same questions over and over throughout the week. So thank you. For that. <laughs> She's welcome. really good at that, actually. You're very welcome. <laughs> um, Kelly, I got to ask before we – first, you, and obviously the, the, the numerous amounts of success at the U.S. Women's Open and obviously the disappointment that you just talked about yeah. uh, in your previous performances. So is this your favorite event, and, and why, if so? It's by far my, my favorite event. I think it's the most pre prestigious title you can win within our sport, within golf, within tennis, everything else. I really think it stands up there for the reason that it's a very, very long format. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. The cream usually does rise to the top. I, I love match play. That's the tradition of the event itself. I hope that doesn't go away. Um, it, it's just 
it's a long time. It's mentally draining. It's a grind. And that's why I want to design a t-shirt this year that has the grind on the back of my, my jersey with a bowling ball going through it or meat grind because you just – the mentality is there. And I think some of these younger bowlers don't realize that sometimes you're not going to win it in five games or eight games. It's going to be the 53. Uh, but, yeah, I, I just – I love the duration of it. I love the competition. You're always bowling against the best in the world, not just the United States. And I, I have been disappointed the last two years of my finishes. Last year, I didn't even cash. It was heartbreaking. I, I literally was crying when I threw my last ball. I hit a bad pair, and I, I thought I bowled the best I could possibly bowl. And um, I was misguided in my own education of what services I should have had. We went one direction. I think we should have went another. I didn't, not necessarily I didn't trust myself. I was just unsure of myself. And then the year before in Florida, I had made the cashers round and missed the top 24. So an event where I've been dominant for so long to all of a sudden go on the back of the bus, it's frustrating. It's really frustrating, and I was really hoping to make a change this year. I, I love the new changes. I'm all for the eight bowling balls, the three different conditions, the not adjusting them. I, I think that's fair playing ground for everybody. Uh, I just I do know one of the rules was different when the last warm-up before match play of the last game of, of match play of the 48 games. But um, it is by far my, my, my favorite event out of all of them. And then from a venue perspective, and Aaron, I'll let you get back into it here. Um, obviously, Virginia Street, you know, Reno, uh, very unique, of course. Bowling has seen uh, its variances of, of unique venues. You mentioned U.S. Women's Open before, of course, at Cowboy Stadium, Le Leanne, for example. I think back to the Masters and uh, Sean Rash winning at Miller Park. If you could uh, come up with any venue or venues, and I'll give you multiple answers to host a major event like like what you've experienced, what venues might come to mind? What, what where would you put bowling uh, center stage from a venue perspective? Uh, from a venue perspective, I would have to think uh, Nebraska football stadium because I think it seats about eighty five thousand mm -hmm. people. I think you'd get a great crowd for that one. That would be one of my venues for sure. Um, oh. These are good questions, guys. Cowboy Stadium was pretty cool. Let me think. Baseball. I think a hockey arena would be great. You yeah, know? that's – yes. A hockey arena would be pretty cool because you kind of have the surround seating so you can see mm -hmm. from all different angles. Lower bowl would be pretty cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think uh, any of the hockey venues as well. And um, let me see. I have to admit, I do like the more personal personal settings. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think Kegel – or even the ITRC because you just get a smaller crowd, you really fill it up. Uh, but some, some really good choices, yeah. So Nebraska Husky Stadium, um, a hockey arena, and then hmm, what would be cool would, would be Cooperstown New York Baseball Stadium, one of the okay. oldest baseball stadiums in the United States. I think that would be pretty, pretty interesting, some historic value there as well. I thought you were about to say Wrigley Field, and I was just going to hang up. I hang up the call. Come on, Come on, <laughs> uh, Soldier Field. I would throw Soldier Field, but that's just me being a Chicago uh, fan, of course, a sports fan. Aaron, what about you? Uh, well, getting back to uh, the last dance, can't I can't leave out Madison Square Garden. So that'd be. I'd go with that. Pretty solid setting too. I, so. I'd have to pick a setting somewhere in Hawaii, uh, just to throw it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii would have to be another choice as well. But you know, it's a shame you couldn't do the the Sydney Opera Hall in Australia. I just to think the surround sound and everything. Just another one to throw out there. I, I really hope Greg Moore and Tennille are listening and taking notes right now on this. So that would be just future destinations. <laughs> future destinations. Yeah, future destinations. Now, uh, Kelly, kind of getting back to one of the things you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, talking about younger players a little bit. And we've had a, a few younger players on the show the last two times out, Julia Bond and uh, Sydney Brummett. And they both have spoken very highly of you and kind of as, as a mentor, helping them kind of transition from the collegiate game to the tour game. I know we had a question in the chat as well uh, from our guy, Chris, who uh, I'll, I'll go with his question. He says, a number of people mentioned you as a mentor and someone who provides guidance to up-and-comers, who played that role in your career, and would you consider collegiate coaching? Ah, good, good question. Um, I don't know if I would consider collegiate coaching, and the only reason being is this. I have been living out of a suitcase since I was 12 years old. I spent <laughs> a lot of great summers going to camps, from basketball camp, bowling camp, to softball camp, and loved every bit of it. I've given up so many weekends, 
And as a college coach, I would just be giving up more of them. So I don't know if that would be my route. I, I applaud Brian and Shannon and um, Kaylee Bandy and all those other coaches out there that do it because it is, it's not a nine to five job. It's basically six to seven day a week job. Maybe not something I'm interested in. Um, influential, you know, I've always gravitated to older people. I feel for many reasons. One, I just matured earlier at a younger age. I have two older sisters, seven, eight years older, and I always looked up to them for the answers. I gravitate to older, older individuals because they're wiser. They live longer. They have more answers to my questions. They've, they've, they've lived it, and it, it allows me to not make as many mistakes, get some good advice, and go along the way. So um, no, by not make it's not an age thing, but like Carolyn Doran Ballard and Dell Ballard. Dell obviously one of the greats. Carolyn one of the greats. Her sister, Kathy, uh, they were very much influences, uh, influencers of me on the ladies' tour. Uh, Jeff Lizzie, Kathy's husband, I palled around with him when I was on the men's tour. Um, Walter Ray Williams, and by far, Parker. Parker Bone has been a New Jersey fellow, New Jersey man. His wife, Leslie, and the kids and everything, but he is just a good guy, not only on the lanes, off the lanes, but everywhere. He's just He's got that reputation. So I really learned a lot from Carolyn and Dell. Um, I, I learned a lot from Liz, just how she approaches it from her, her direction, being a little bit more introverted. I'm a little bit more extroverted. Uh, she's taught me a lot, and I, I value our friendship with her and Kasha. Um, Leanne, especially, being a fellow Storm staffer now, too. But really, the women that were ahead of me and paved the way for me, Tish Johnson was the first person I ever crossed within a professional event as an amateur. And she said, one goes over here, one goes over here. And you go, and she taught me the double jump rule. You know, and I think about that as like, I know there are some people out there or professionals that don't want to take the time to do that, but I know people before me that have taken the time to work with me, and I just want to return the same favor. So if I can give those young ladies some guidance along the way without yelling at them, I think everything is like you're doing, instead of saying you're doing it wrong, make it a teachable moment. And instead of calling them out, say, hey, have you ever thought about attacking it this way? Or what about... Yeah, that's an idea, but what about thinking about it this way? And I really just try to turn things around into a teachable moment, make the person feel better about themselves rather than criticizing or critique them or, or putting them down in a way that just makes them feel less less of a person. So I just I want everybody to be uplifted, be positive, and know that it's not over until the last ball is thrown. I have to say with the, with the Tish mention, and she, and she might get mad at me for having this, but at the uh, 2017 <laughs> Senior Queens, uh, she actually gave a, uh, a demonstration to the whole field to kind of how the double jump rule works. And I, I have that video. If, if, if I wouldn't know this would have come up, I would have had it ready, but, <laughs> uh, but, it, but it was great. And so that was, uh, when, you, when you mentioned that, I went right back to that moment. She, she's a great person, you know, she's we, awesome, we yeah. all get in our moments and everything, but she took the time to explain it to me. And the joke is, and Tennille will say this too, you know, Tennille says, just ask your fellow professional on your pair. They will help you. They'll help you once. After that, they come and get me. And I always say, come to me, I'll help you at least twice. So it's, it's, it's because if it does go, if you teach them and they get it right, the flow is so much better. But if you sit there and say, oh, you keep jumping, it, it just, my emotions get high, their emotions get high. We become frantic, and it's bad for everybody. So why not make it good for everybody? Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you can share, uh, without getting too personal, obviously, with individuals and, and what you guys talk about, but what are some of the common questions that you receive from uh, from younger players or, or newer players who are, who are trying to make it out on tour? Main question is, is it, can, you, can you do it? Can you make a living at it? And um, I think nowadays you would have to almost have another job and be able to come out on the weekends. The way our program, our tour is designed, it's really designed for that, for the working woman to be able to work and then in the summertime have that Thursday, Friday, Saturday to, to compete, and especially now with the regional program they have in place. So that's great. Um, you have to get your feet wet. The only way to experience it is to do it. You can read in books, you can watch YouTube, you can Google every question possible. But until you actually go through it and, and live the emotions, that's the only way and the best way to experience it. And the difference between our tour now and what our tour was back in, in the early 2000s was we had 28 weeks. These are only eight weeks trying to get to the last four weeks in the exempt field. It's much different. So you could afford to have a bad week. Now, if it's your living, you really can't. You can afford to have maybe one, but that's it. That's, that's the limit. Uh, so the mentality is to say, you will get knocked down. 
But if you get back up and try, if you work at it, and there'll be women out there that will tell you what you need to do. It's, it's very seldom now that I see some of the youngsters practicing after they've missed the cut. I would have taken the opportunity if I missed out on something to try to figure out what I did wrong or what I can do better next time I faced that obstacle again. So, but some of those things there, it's just, you have to experience it in order to understand what the emotions are to go through it, how to deal with it. It's okay to cry. Just try to do it outside because that means you love it and you care about it. It's okay to celebrate, but it's also the best part is to be a good sport. You need to, you need to be, you need to recognize why you're there, how you got there, who helped you to get there and then put it in perspective. Well said, well said. Mm -hmm. Nice question, by the way, Chris, I know he's watching. Yes, yes. Thank you, Chris. And once again, if, uh, if anyone out in the chat has uh, anything else, uh, we'll work that in towards the end of the broadcast. And uh, Kelly, obviously, when the when the tour ended in 2003, that was rough for everybody. But, uh, you know, you you went out and you got your PBA card, uh, got your exemption in 2006 uh, and then eventually led to, of course, the gigantic win at the tournament at Champions. Uh, from your time bowling on the PBA tour, what were some of the biggest lessons you really uh, learned not only about your game, but about yourself uh, competing in that environment. You're just another number. You know, you've got your friends and everything, but everybody's out there to make a living. Everybody's out there to strive to win. And um, male, female, you're, you're a number. Um, with that being said, it's still a small organization. All the gentlemen are professional, and I, I learned a lot from them. Um, it's tough. It's a tough way to make a living. It's not a glorious lifestyle. We don't stay in five-star hotels. We don't eat steak every night. Sometimes we're bunking up with one or two people. We're, we're, we're sharing car rides so to cut down on costs. So it's not as glamorous as it's made out to be. Uh, you almost have to have a supplemental job on the side just to make up for it. So I think that's where it comes to wear and tear is mentally. But uh, I learned a lot. I mean, men in general, just with the rev rate, they can generate so much more power and action with the pins than women can. I mean, granted, there's some, some players now that can really keep up with them. Uh, my feeling was this, when I bowled those two years on tour, I was able to hit the pocket just as much as, as the Ryan, Ryan Schaefer, as, as Parker, as, you know, Tommy Jones, but my carry percentage was just not nearly as good. I got nine a lot. And if I didn't get nine and I was guessing, I would get some, some horrible leads where they would break up a lot more pins than I would. So I felt like I could compete alongside of them but winning once was great to be able to do it over and over again. It would be just as hard. And even looking at the men now, other than Belmo and maybe some EJ Tackett along the way, Tommy Jones is having a stellar year right now. How many bowlers have dominated on the men's tour? You know, there's maybe a handful, five to eight gentlemen that make a living doing it. So it's, it's really hard. It's, it's, not, it's not a glamorous lifestyle. It really is. Now, I know we have a few a few PWBA players still out there, uh, you know, events like the World Series of Bowling, Masters, uh, U.S. Open still competing. And obviously yourself and Liz are are in very exclusive uh, rare air uh, winning out on the PBA Tour. If there was a player out on tour right now who you think could join you two in that, uh, in that particular uh, accomplishment, uh, who are kind of your front runners for uh, being able to find that same type of success? Front runners for sure, and I believe she's got the talent, she's got the game, she's got the versatility. She just needs to grow mentally on her level. It's Daria Pyok. I mean, she's had some success out there on the men's tour already. Um, so her by far would be one of them. I think Shannon O'Keefe would do very, very well, really because mentally she's the strongest I've ever seen her. She can outshine anybody. But because of her axis tilt and rotation being more of a spinner type, she's able to create a lot more length and play straighter angles than most players can. And I think on the shorter patterns, she would be a, a dominant force to keep up with. So those two by far uh, of the younger girls standing out, um, none that I can think of right now off the top of my head. Um, I want to say some of our junior team USA bowlers have a very good chance too, if, if they wanted to grow up to it. But Daria for sure. Shannon, Shannon's got a good percentage. I know Danielle has competed and has done well in the world events. I just think when she has to go a little more and more inside and out, that's where she struggles. And, and really the men start to shine after they build up that friction and that hook spot they can just throw it to. Again, she'll hit the pocket every single frame. She just might get nine a lot, that's all. And that's just getting a little bit more creative with your, with your hand release and position. 
and maybe some ball speed. So, but just, I would put her up in that top three as well. And then, of course, recently uh, she you know, would have put herself, or really did put herself, in position to uh, to enter that club. She did make match play at the World Series, uh, I believe it was the Scorpion. And then, of course, COVID hit, and then the World Series had to be postponed. So uh, that is still to to TBD. So we could see D Max still enter um, that 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 exclusive club. Of course, Clara has made a show. Uh, right. at the World Series as well um, a few years back. So uh, great question again, Aaron. Uh, great answer, by the way. Appreciate that, Kelly. Sure. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Sydney Urban. Sydney, we'll get to your question uh, in just a second, but thank you for watching uh, the PWBA podcast. Uh, she's got a question, and we will get to that in momentarily for Kelly. Um, as Aaron alluded to, Kelly, you, you that kind of fast forward it to 2010 and then you know just an exclusive run obviously the tournament of champions you also win the queens that year you also win the u.s women's open um and i believe either the malaysian open or the singapore open that year um as well what were some of your favorite memories from that stretch that is now of course a, a 10 years old at this point <laughs> Oh, really aging. <laughs> thank God for it's an anniversary. Uh, thank God for history lessons. Um, they were all so special. I, I, I mean, 2010, the tournament champions, I just remember the crowd there. I, I just The nighttime, the last round of match play, the crowd, the cheering, I, it, it, it was like a 1980 telecast of somebody shooting 300. It was just fantastic to feel all that people in the building and all that energy. El Paso was the Queens. I ran the step ladder. Everybody had the chance for a coach. I didn't pick one. Everyone else had a coach with them if they wanted to. I just did it solo. I had my mother sitting behind me and my friends just for support and encouragement. And then, um, let's see, that was the Queens. And then the U.S. Open in City View in Texas. And then again in the ITRC to film it. It was just a great show. And to, be a, to receive that green jacket was fantastic. And then taking it internationally. There are so many highlights along the way. And I already forget what the question was, Emil, but... Um, favorite memories it was it was a magical year I, I i don't know if i could pick one um i think my mother always thought she was a jinx so she wasn't in texas <laughs> but she was there with me in el paso and she was there at me at the tsc so just being able to have her there was by far when i handed her the trophy tammy tammy turner to this day still laughs because i handed her the trophy and my mother said oh good i'll use it as an ashtray that's one line away. That's one line away. You know, God rest your soul. But you know, it was to use as an ashtray. So the the fact that she was there, she said oh, she thought she was a bad luck charm, and she wasn't. So I was to be the first woman to ever win a title, and for her to experience that with me and watching me grow up and mature and go after these dreams and goals that she always watched me do, what was the best part of it all is having her there by my side. I'm very curious, uh, you know, as a media individual. Um, and looking back at those moments for you just as a fan at that time. And, and I was just getting started really with uh, from a USBC perspective in, the, in a media role. But what was the media attention like for you? Because, you know, I've read plenty of, uh, of articles and stories from, you know, the New York Times, ESPN, uh, for example. What was it like to to kind of go through the media gauntlet, if you will, and 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 talk about not only yourself but really have the sport um and at the time you know you were the the anchor of women's bowling in that in that situation as well uh, when i won the tsc like for five days a week for three weeks i was driving to my local bowling center jersey lanes to do another interview i mean it was just one after another after another where can we locate you where can we get to um that publicity alone was fantastic from that being able to do the espn magazine i mean Bowling to me is not a sport that's well respected from the other from the other professional sports, and to be able to be displayed in that magazine amongst Apollo Ono and um, the race car Indy race car driver at the time, it just that was a highlight as well. And I know we'll get to it later. The comic book, I never imagined that, but people care about what you do and the success you have, but they also forget about it very quickly. But if you can have a presence as who you are they'll remember that even longer. And that's where you build those friendships and relationships. Um, so those were just some of the highlights along the way. I don't know what the question was again, Emil. I just started rambling. <laughs> no, no, you, you, you pretty much answered that. I was curious what, what it was like to go through the, the media gauntlet, if you will, when you accomplishing what you accomplished and, and obviously being uh, the pillar at that point for women's bowling is obviously someone, a woman winning uh, on the men's tour at that, at that time. 
Well, I, I really, because I made the men's tour in 06, you know, I remember uh, there's another media moment. I was dating Jim Tomek at the time, and he didn't make it, but he had been on the tour and had success. And we're driving back home to Pennsylvania, where he lives, and then me go over to New Jersey, and my phone never stopped ringing. And at one point, when the phone stopped, he looked over to me, and he goes, do you realize what you just did? And I was like, no, not really, because it was always a goal of mine to, to make the men's tour and mm-hmm. go on tour. And so I was like, you have no clue what you just did. And I said, no, no, I'm just, I kept... One phone call after the next, after the next, and just took it there. And um, I do remember the TSC after winning being escorted off the lanes by the lane guy, um, Kirk, and everyone to go to pr- uh, a private room for media, and, and nobody could touch me. Like they literally were barricading people away so I could walk through, and I'd never experienced anything like that before. So, um, you know, there's this, I guess some people will say there's no such thing as bad press. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but. It definitely exposed me in a way I never imagined. Um, I would have loved to have met Oprah or Ellen DeGeneres, but and go to the um, the NFL, the Super Bowl, and meet Peyton mm-hmm. Manning because maybe he would have divorced his wife and married me. But no, it's just they. You just I will say this: you just have to be careful what you say. You know, it's okay to be truthful and honest, but you have to make sure you know who wants to who wants to read truthful and honest. That's all. Right. I remember specifically uh, going back to team trials when you made the made the tour because, as a little known fun fact, uh, Stardust Bowl in Hammond, Indiana, was the uh, center for that, and uh, yeah. I was actually there every day that year. So wow. I was secretly one of the young lads in the back cheering you on for that. <laughs> so so that was super cool. And then when you got some of the national news, I, was, I remember watching that. And I saw a few of my buddies in the background when you were like filling out your scorecard or something like that. So that that had a that particular moment was was very special for me too, uh, and you know you, we kind of mentioned the uh, comic book thing, and I think uh, from stories I've heard that kind of stemmed from a pro am appearance, I believe. Yeah, Pennsylvania. I, I met uh, Peter David's daughter Ariel, and I, I I just took the time to to talk to her as a person, you know, answer some questions about bowling and so forth, and uh, it's not that we developed a friendship, but we just had a respect for each other. And lo and behold, when I went to Long Island on the men's tour. Her father, Peter David, who was the creator of the Hulk character in the comic book world, had approached me. And I remember I was 63rd out of 64th. And I'm like, you really want to talk to me? I'm like, what? I'm 63rd on the board. I, I'm not having a good week. And no, I just because I took the time to, to talk to her and, and um, relate to her and, and be a role model possibly and, and stuff like that. He's, he's a great guy. I still keep in touch with Peter to this day. And the fact that I got to be in a Spider-Man comic book, I mean, again, I, I looked at the cells. I have the cells that Todd Nock had drawn up, and I'm still waiting to get framed. So that's on my list of things to do when Michael's or one of those hobby stores opens up. Yeah, fantastic times. That's uh, Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man number 20, I believe, for all you collectors yep. out there. Yep. Uh, like, as far as, you know, and I don't know how much you were into that particular world or if that was kind of new to you, but, uh, you know, I'm just curious, did they like, you know, as they were sketching it out, did they send stuff to you? Did you add things here and there? Were you kind of part of the process too? Or was it just kind of, uh, they sent it along at the end or did you get to get involved too? Uh, no, I was not involved at all. Peter had asked me some questions, you know, any wishes I had. I said, could I be thin? You know, <laughs> and, and, and I, I like to fly. So in, in, towards the end of that section, I'm flying in the air with Spider-Man. That was my two main requests. You see, my nails were painted, and I very seldom have my nails painted in the comic book. But those are my only two requests, just to, to be a little thinner and a fly. Uh, but they showed me the end product before they before it went to color and to print, and that was that was part of pretty neat. Todd Nuck, like I said, I think it's K N A U K, was the illustrator and the and the graphic artist, and um, it, it was just, he was great to to work with. I think he he caught every angle, every cheekbone. Uh, everything that that was right with me physically, so he did a fantastic job. Very cool. Very cool. Aaron, you've got some ties, right? You 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 are now uh, uh, you're no longer a novice in the in the comic book world, right? Uh, I'm slowly I'm slowly <laughs> getting more into that. So that was actually a uh, I picked that up as a as a Christmas gift for my girlfriend because she's a very big Kelly Kulik fan. So ah. so I think she's actually watching right now. So hi, Jasmine. <laughs> hey jazz um so kel now you're part of the team usa coaching staff uh first of all did you ever think you would be a part of uh that that staff like the team usa coaching staff after many years and, and still presently as a player 
No, I, I did not, not at all. I mean, I don't know how long my adult career on Team USA is, is going to last. I do see it progressing to the senior level, like Leanne and Carolyn and, and, and all those women that have bowled for our country once you get past the 50 age. So I do see myself doing that. Why not? I mean, just keep bleeding red, white, and blue until, until I can't bleed no more. Um, but I, I never thought I would be part of the, the junior Team USA program. And I think Brian O'Keefe, when I interviewed for the position, I said, you know, guys, I would love it, but I do think I'm still a little – little rusty. I need a little bit more coaching myself to, to be able to be a good coach or one else. I love that we have, you know, Andy Dirks, Mike Shady, Phil Warren, Baker, and now Kim is back on our staff again. I wish she didn't have to go, which she had never left and everything. Um, but I, I've just, I continue to look up to the ones ahead of me, um, take from them. And then what I have learned through my Dick Ricker coaching as well. And I, I just, I love watching good bowling. I mean, don't, don't who doesn't. Who, I, and, and by watching good bowling, and being able to influence the Mabel Cummings and, and the youngsters and um, uh, their name, just all those boys that I watched coach and everything, uh, they motivate me to be better. You know, they really do. They motivate me to get on the lanes to practice and everything else. But if I can have a little bit of influence, no credit. The credit always goes to the bowler, to the athlete. But if I can have some sort of influence that say, well, I made this choice because I, I was taught this way rather than making this choice, it, doesn't, it makes me feel good, but it just makes me feel good that people are doing the right things and that they will one day, if they don't get the outcome they, they think they should, they, they soon will because the time, the work ethic, the dedication is there, the motivation is there to do it. And um, I, I just want to – I even watch my own competitors to be successful. That's what's wrong with me as a professional athlete. You know, I, I enjoy watching people be successful you know, and how they handle it. And it also teaches me how I can handle it better in the future. I know there's been some instances I wish I'd done something different. But I, I enjoy seeing people successful because there's one true fact in bowling. No matter how good you are, the best in the world, Jason Belmonte, Shannon O'Keefe, the top two on the men and women's tours right now, you're not going to win every time. It's just not going to happen. There's going to be bad breaks, good breaks, and so forth. And you have to be able to learn how to handle that in order to be successful down the road. So that's the one true fact I know. The best doesn't always win every single time. Did you have any, uh, you kind of mentioned a little bit, any specific goals uh, just from a from the coaching perspective? Like at some point you'd like to coach you know, the team to a world championship title or, or you know, a gold medal uh, or multiple gold medals, et cetera. Any, any, any goals like that? Um, I wanted the, the bowlers to feel comfortable with me. Like I, I, I imagine there was some sense of idolization being the sure. professional bowler and the commentator, but I wanted them to feel comfortable watching the young girls. I wasn't there. I had to leave to go bowl a PWA mm -hmm. stuff in Florida, which I bowled really well at that week. Um, I just, it's hard to hear Coach Kelly. I'm used to just being a Kelly. Where's Kelly? I just, you know, where's Kelly? She's over here. Not <laughs> Coach Kelly. So distinguishing between the adult and the coach versus the adult and the player, and then there's Kelly overall. It's earning their respect as well as I'm earning theirs. And to, be, and to have them feel comfortable Especially before Kim came back, I was the only female. And, you know, there's, there's issues. Girls can only ask other girls. And I just wanted them to feel comfortable with me to say, hey, I can go ask her anything. And um, especially, you know, I, I, I never had a pressuring parent. And I, I do see a few of those out there. I just wanted to say words through actions and verbal positivity, you know, and, and building up their, their morale, building up their, their confidence and self-esteem. You know, I see in Liz Culkin, she thinks she's unstoppable, and she is because of how she sees herself. Her self-image is really strong, and I just want these young girls and young men to know that they're very important to me as a player, but also as a person, and just building up their self-confidence and self-image about themselves. And if they do that, chances are it rolls over into their bowling. So you, you build up the person, and then the person places it into their, into their profession, and that's how you make successful athletes. You build up the person first. Excellent stuff, Kelly. Uh, we're hitting about the hour mark, so we're kind of getting near the end here. But uh, in talking about Team USA and coaching, uh, I think that's going to transition well into one of our questions here from the chat. Uh, we mentioned Sydney Urban. I believe she is one of the players at Mount Mercy for Coach Andy Dirks. Mm -hmm. And uh, her question is, Kelly, it took you three attempts at Team USA trials to make Team USA for the first time. What did you change and focus on in order to, to make the team? So I'm guessing Sydney potentially, you know, looking to make that next leap in her game too. So this is the perfect experience. You know, um, a guppy 
swimming with a pile of sharks. So this is what it was. When I won Team USA, it was state qualifying and you got to go off to the nationals. There were four of us, two males and two females. I knew what I was in New Jersey. I was 18 years old. I had just beaten some of the best women in New Jersey. When I went to the national level, I had no clue what I was getting into. I really didn't know what Team USA was about. And then I see Linda, then I see Liz, then I see Patrick Healy, I see Chris Barnes, I see some of the best bowlers in the world. And I was like, oh my God, what did I just get into? I was a guppy swimming with the sharks, finished second to last. So when I got to go back again, I was like, okay, I know what I saw. I know what I experienced. Remember, you can only experience it by doing it to learn what you need to improve on. I went back. I went to camp that summer. I practiced on my mental game. I worked on some versatility in my ball releases and speed. I bowled on the harder conditions, not the ones I was already good at, but the ones I sucked at, basically, and got stronger at those. And then I went back to St. Louis. And my goal was to make, I think, the top 24 for match play. I think that year I finished 36 or 38. So from second to last to 38 is pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. And then the next year I went to Minnesota. And here I'm leading at one point in the field. And then I qualified second for the show. And then lose to Janet Pizinski, who eventually beat uh, Lisa Nori. So it's just, it's that learning curve. You're, you're, you're not always going to have success the first time out. And... When you go out and you see what's there in the world, like now with you youngsters in junior gold, you know, you see what you are in your state, but then you all of a sudden you see what's in the United States and like, oh my God, these kids are good. And then you, you learn what you need to improve on. You go back, you work on it. Earl Anthony, his first year out on tour, I think made only two cuts out of 32. Went home to a center that his parents owned, practiced. Next thing you know, he won multi-titles year after year after year, player of the year. Most titles up until Walter Ray Williams Jr. surpassed him. So you have to know where you stand in order to grow and get better. And, but just remember where you came from because it's, it's proof that you may be down here, but now look where you are. You're all the way up here. So you got to start with a foundation and just keep building up those, those steps along the ladder to get there. Very awesome. Thanks, Kelly. And thank you, Sydney, for the question. We've got one more in the chat before we uh, kind of get to our wrap-up question. So David is asking, uh, hey, Kelly. Why don't you put a team in the PBA league that could use you in Las Vegas? <sighs> That's really good. I, I really enjoyed my time with the New York Kingpins. It was great because I don't have my PBA card anymore. I dropped it a few years ago and really just solely focused on the women. I'm no longer eligible. However, if I have a good year this year or next year, I may throw my ring back in my hat in the ring again just to see. Uh, I would love to see a women's team. You know, I would, it's not, Tom Clark doesn't have to do it, but I, I think it'd be fantastic to have an all-women's team represent that. I don't know if it's chosen or picked like the men's are, if it would go on the points list, you know, but I think it would be fantastic just to have that presence, not in terms of fairness, but just to, to bring that local presence. There's, there's women in the audience, too, and I say this all the time, women bowl, too, our membership, women bowl, too. I, I think Emil and I would be 100% on board with that idea. So. 100%. No, no question about it. Count me in. Count me no in. No doubt. No doubt. Excellent questions in the chat, too. Yeah, thanks, guys, for the questions. All right, Emil, I think uh, now that you're back, you, you left us for a quick second. Yeah, sorry about that. No, that's all right. We missed you, though. That's, did you wash your hands? That's all I ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I never left the table. It was only a half a millisecond I was gone. So, so uh, But that's afterwards. Okay. I do have my uh, hand sanitizer nearby, though. It's always, I'm always prepped. Uh, I do have a couple questions before we get to our, our final, final question. Uh, Gail, just um, favorite PWBA moments just as a, as a whole when you look back, um, you know, in the early course and portion from the tour perspective, obviously, uh, our current iteration of the PWBA tour, some of your favorite moments or, and or stories if you can share before we uh, wrap things up. Um. Obviously, the U.S. Open in Reno was great. My mom was there to share that, too. She was gambling. I had pancakes, and they were terrible. So I remember that very much in my brain, that I had to use a butter knife to cut pancakes. Why? I don't understand. Um, the relaunch of the ladies' tour, being the spokesperson, being responsible, being the com commentator when I wasn't on the show, taking on that responsibility. I always said I wear many hats, and I've, been, I've always said I can wear the hats. I sometimes feel it's taken away from my concentration in one, but... To be able to bring that perspective and, and put it in the spotlight and to really showcase the women, I've been honored to do that. So the relaunch of the ladies' tour, um, the history and bringing back the PWA Hall of Fame and watching the women before me, 
be honored for their achievement and knowing it'll be there in the future. Um, but really, I, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed the friendships I've made in traveling the United States and all the proprietors, all the centers, all the fans. I know I've pissed off a few, but I've made many more acquaintances than I've lost. And um, you know, say you go to Indianapolis and you have family there or friends there to California. Leanne laughs at me all the time. I'm at an NYC. She goes, your friends are here. You know so many people. <laughs> and it's just because I, I've kept up with those connections and those relationships. So I've got friends all over this country, all over the world. And that's the, the best part out of all of this is the memories I've made and the people I've shared them with. Uh, Liz Johnson, we don't talk a lot during the year, but we're really close when we're out there. We, we can both relate to each other and what we've done. You know, her and both I and the men, so we have a lot in common. She's just a, she's a great person. She's a great human being. Uh, Carolyn and Devil, I really looked up to them a lot in these last few years for role models, for questions. I think Carolyn's really, really smart. And when I need perspective, I can call her and ask for it. And I'm, I'm also grateful, not for just the past sponsors, but Storm during these difficult times. I mean, I was with Ebonite for a long period of times and, and they're a great company. And, uh, but I'm just grateful that, and I'm also grateful for you guys because without you, Emil and Aaron and Matt Canizaros and, and all the other press out there, we don't get to be on the screen like this without the, the likelihood of you and the Kathy Kavickis and the other Kathy and Tennille. So I'm Jason Thomas and, and everybody. I'm so grateful because without you guys, we have nowhere to, to, to be seen. So I'm thankful for the people I'm friends with, for the people that keep making me look good. And um, just the amount of friendships I've made, it's been fantastic. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, likewise, obviously, it, you make our jobs fun, certainly, uh, no matter what happens. And the one thing that I've always appreciated uh, from you is that uh, you always tell us you're an open book. And that's I, I feel that's very rare. Not everyone is so apt to be so upfront, uh, especially with someone from a media perspective. So I've always appreciated that. Um, is that something? And this, this will be my last question. Is that something that you've just been, is that the way you are? That's the way you've been? That's the way you were taught? Um, uh, does someone say, hey, you know, it's it's important to, to be, um, you know, open and responsible, so to speak, when you're when you're referencing the media? You, you have, well, <laughs> people, would, people would advise against that. Um, <laughs> right. I have a hard time being dishonest. I really do. I, just, I want, the truth is the truth. It, it defines you as a human being. So... Getting to know me, like you all know it. I Before you know me, I'm very quiet. I won't be very outgoing mm -hmm. and talk to people. But once I start to feel comfortable around you, I can't shut up. I can tell a joke. I can, you know, laugh over drinks and, and a nice meal and everything. So I, once I feel like I've trusted the person, then, yeah, it is an open book. I mean, there's certain things I won't reveal. Everybody's got skeletons in the closet. Mine's Harry. He's upstairs in the closet. <laughs> um, so but I, I just... It's who I am. I don't know how to be anything different. I wouldn't want to be anything different. And it has gotten me in trouble, but it's you, you, what you see is what you get. So you know what you're getting, it, what, it's what it is. Perfect. Aaron? All right. I'm going to have one additional question to add in and late because uh, you, you talked about a lot of great folks in the bowling industry. Uh, Terry Bigham, one of those as well. Terry sent me a quick note, said, uh, obviously, uh, another position you've uh, held has been with the USBC board. And I believe uh, this is coming up on year number nine. Wow. Yeah, I've got through uh, June, July, I have two and a half, three months left, three months left. July 31st, I've served all nine years, yeah. So uh, what, what has that experience been like for you in, uh, you know, just being able to give back to the sport in that manner? Uh, but first on the board, there were a lot of changes being made. We had a lot of people change positions and a lot of conference calls I was unaware of. Uh, my voice is really to be for the athletes, but not just only the athletes. So. I really learned from the role models there, Joe Diamond, Karen Joe, some of the other women, some of the men along the way, Andrew Kane and what he's done, Frank Wilkinson. Um, it's just really understanding what the whole picture is supposed to look like. Like the PWA is just a little piece. You know, junior gold is just a piece. The open championships is a big piece of it, but it's really about our memberships. And even though I'm on the board, I, I really come from that, that role of just being my membership is of $26 or $28 a year and what it provides me as, as a member of USBC. It's been great. It's been frustrating. I've agreed with some changes. I've disagreed with some. Um, it's, it's nice to see, you know, that's what life is. So you're not always going to get along with everybody. And, but you need the devils and the angels in the room in order to, to meet in the middle and come up with a, a compromise and a decision that's going to be best for everybody, not just a small amount. So it's been a good experience. I'm glad it's coming to an end. I'm not going to lie. 
Uh, I think that Liz Culkin was now just nominated to the to the board. I think she'll do a very good job because she's not afraid to speak up, and you have to have that in the in that meeting room as well. But I've really been a voice for the athletes, especially on the women's side, just trying to keep the equality there and, and the benefits there. Uh, it's been a great experience seeing where the PWA was once um, an idea formulated on the side, and it came to concept, and now I've been a part of that too. I wasn't even on the committee, but it's it's great to know that I've served and that I can, again, be an example for others of, of what you can give back to the sport. And we thank you for that. And a big thanks to all those folks. I know you just mentioned a few, but a lot of great folks uh, who give yeah. their time to the, to the USBC board, BPWA all board. All volunteer. And all, that. Mm -hmm. all volunteer, yep. All right, Kelly, I think we're, uh, I think we're ready for the final question. Emil? Kelly, yes. what are your... Uh, binge watch recommendations. So what are the Kelly Kulik binge watch recommendations? Obviously, a lot of folks have a lot of time on their hands in the last couple of months. Uh, so so what's on the binge watch list for you? All right. Well, my favorite TV shows right now, uh, they're in the second season, just going to conclude next Sunday, is The Rookie. That's one. It's oh, on Sunday nights okay. on ABC. I do mm -hmm. like The Rookie because, you know, a 45-year-old reinventing herself as a cop, I think I fall right in line there. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to police New Jersey. Don't look for the gun or, or Charlie Dingo. So that's one I really do enjoy. Um, I also think New Amsterdam is, okay. is a great TV show on NBC, also on, on 10 o'clock on Tuesday evenings. Um, I've been recommended a few shows I haven't. There is one show that I recently binge watched, only the first season. Uh, I, I do, I'm fascinated with history, and it's a very sad part of history, but about the Holocaust and everything. And there's the Amazon Prime members called The Hunters with Al Pacino, and I did happen to binge watch the first season in about the course of a week. So big fan of Al Pacino, big fan of the history behind it um, and, and everything that went on there. So the Hunters on Amazon Prime would be would be another go to. Those are those are my top three right now. I mean, I mean there's so many TV. I'm still MASH is by far my favorite TV yes. show of all time. Let's go. I still, Alan Alda, I just he's by far <laughs> one of my favorite. So. I still can turn it on on me TV and TV land and still <laughs> laugh my head off all the time just watching and pick on Frank Burns and Charles Winchester. Love me some Hawkeye. Yep. <laughs> That's one answer that uh, never changes on Kelly's bio that I send out every year. Yeah, Favorite Matt, TV show, man. Matt, Matt <laughs> cookies and Jaws. And just so you know, I bought the Jaws game board. I, I'm waiting to try out the new game, uh, Jaws. It's How a, about that? It's a game board. So it's at Target on sale for $11. So I'm ready to save Amityville. <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah. Nicely done. All right, I have to ask, and she mentioned Pacino. We had uh, Julia Bond mentioned she had been getting into a Robert De Niro kick. So since they're kind of along the same lines, yeah. uh, if you had to pick a favorite Al Pacino movie. Oh. Uh, oh, wow. I don't know. I think he, uh, Scent of a Woman. Okay. That was a good one. He's been in so many. I mean, the young one, yeah. I mean, everybody. Attica, Attica, Attica. <laughs> uh, but when he's older and mature. I also, um, what's the one with Keanu Reeves where he's the devil? The oh, Lord. I know which one you're talking about. I can't think yeah, of Yeah, I can't think of the name of it, too. I like him in that one. You know, when, whenever he's trying to be good but he's really evil, that's when I like Al Pacino. And that's why he is in The Hunters. So if you if you do if you want to binge watch the hunters the first season I said it was it, to me it was really really good it takes place in New York so again my neighbor right across the river it's gonna be Devil's Advocate right Devil's Advocate that was it so and I, I will say this guys because we talked about it before this the podcast started but Matt Canazaro famous moment I haven't had it yet <laughs> I, I love Matt to death because he really he's got a very good perspective and I love the questions he asks he asks very good intelligent <laughs> questions. But my favorite moment hasn't happened yet because I want to go on an eating challenge with him. Oh, Matt man. Is, will, uh, yeah, Matt is a foodie, and he does the eating challenges. So I think him and I have a goal to take on the pizza challenge in one of the states when we're out on tour. So it hasn't happened yet, but I know it's going to. That will be my favorite Matt Canizara moment. Excellent. Yes. We'll, uh, wow. Yeah, Let's I make know, sure we know, do this. I know Matt will not turn that down. So <laughs> yeah, there, no. we got to no do it. instance of him. I, I once saw him take on a burger challenge, and he wasn't even hungry, and he still finished it in time. So uh, <laughs> Matt, is a, Matt is a superstar when it comes to that. So yep. I'm, I'm all on board with this. We'll have, to, we'll have to videotape it for sure, so we'll see. Excellent. Aaron, any Go ahead. No, I, I, I think we peaked with that. That was, that was fantastic. Yes. <laughs> any, any final thoughts there? Uh, 
Kelly, I just just want to say thank you uh, for joining us here today. Uh, definitely appreciate uh, you know the, the honest conversations we always have out here, uh, and of course, um, you know we we always look forward to these opportunities, and definitely cannot wait till the next time we get to see you in person. But uh, for today, just uh, thanks for uh, spending some time with us. Yeah, gentlemen, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to, to rekindle with you guys and see you guys, especially on the screen, even though I'd love to see personally out there on the ladies tour right now. Let's all just stay safe, stay healthy, wear our masks, let's just follow those guidelines, and, and soon we'll be back, you know, enjoying those social environments together, celebrating those victories, celebrating each other, and, uh, and, and having a great time. And Kelly, where can fans and uh, watchers, listeners of this podcast follow you and your new handy woman exploits? Ha! Well, <laughs> you guys know I'm not I'm not big on posting. It's just I'm mm -hmm. more of a private mm -hmm. person. You have my Storm fan page on Facebook and my Kelly page on Facebook. Uh, I'm doing my Zoom line meeting, dance meeting on Wednesday nights and everything. If you want to join along in our dance meeting, send me send me a note. I can add you to our account. But uh, really, Facebook is the only place to go. I just um, you, you think even in this downtime, I would have gotten good with the technical guys. I mean, I'm learning Zoom. I'm learning how to, to use Dropbox more efficiently with file sharing and everything. So uh, I, I just, I, I, you know me, I, I say this all the time. I'd rather dig a hole for a coffin than, than be on the computer and learn how to do this. Although this is what our technology is and what society is. So I got to get better at it for sure because I got to teach my dad. And, oh, he's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate the time, Kelly, as always. Thank you so much. Uh, by the way, folks, on Bowl TV coming up this week, we've got Inside the LC. Speaking of Matt Cannizzaro, uh, along with Daniel Farish, they are Inside the LC. They've got uh, Mike Nape tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday with uh, Liz Johnson. So Hall of Fame week continues for us here in the PWBA podcast. Uh, and then we will be uh, – Matt will have the uh, the duo of Steve and Jeff Fair, father and son, on Inside the LC. And then the weekends with the Sport of Bowling show, it'll be uh, Chad Murphy, of course, USBC Executive Director. He will have the BPAA Executive Director, Frank DeSocio, talking about things uh, from the bowling proprietor, bowling center perspective, and especially what's going on with our COVID situation uh, across the world. I uh, want to thank everyone for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to Bolt TV. Uh, all of this content right now, folks, is free. So just create your username and password, and you've got yourself uh, a ton of content. Also, uh, if you're out on your walk, your neighborhood, uh, make it a few mile run when you can. Uh, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play. So give us a subscribe there, rate, and uh, we will see you soon. For Aaron Smith, Kelly Kulik, my name is Emil Williams Jr. We'll see you on Wednesday with the great Liz Johnson on the PWBA Podcast. So long, folks.